so when I um, when I joined the Gatsby in April, I so one in my one of my first meetings with Manish, she said, "Oh, we have this uh, tri center meeting in June in Jerusalem. Would you want to give a talk?" And I said, "Of course, we would love to give a talk there." And we thought, "Oh, two months is a bit close, right?" So it's it's not sure whether we'll actually have that much new material to present, but it would be nice to present new material. So we decided to keep our options open, choose a title which is sort of broad enough that would fit both stuff that I did in tubing and new stuff that I did with Manish. And then we, I sort of, over the last couple of days, I slowly realized that it hadn't come as far as I wanted, and this would also be quite a tough crowd to bluff my way through. <laughs> so we sort of decided to err on the, um, um, on the side of being conservative and, and change the title slightly, and sort of and talk about stuff I did during my PhD in tuning, which broadly fits the same scheme, but the specific thing that I'm going to talk about, some of you have heard a previous version of. So to those, I apologize. Anyway. The, the material that I'm talking about is mostly done during my PhD in tubing. So my main collaborators during the time were my um, PhD advisor, Matthias Bittke, who's recently moved from the MPI to the Univers University of Tubing, and Sebastian Gavin, another graduate student in the lab at the time, and Leonard Weick at U university, who does uh, um, two-photon imaging, but most importantly, um, uh, in optical imaging of uh, intrinsic signals in ferret visual cortex, and Matthias Kashub at Princeton University. And as I also, I mean, already alluded to, I'm going to be um, talking about um, statistical methods for analyzing functional imaging data with a specific focus on estimating and analyzing functional maps. And it's well known that in the early visual cortex of at least many mammals, um, the, the, the layout of neurons across the cortical surface is, is sort of strikingly organized according to the tuning preferences. That means that neurons that have similar tuning um, preferences tend to be nearby. And, and then the layout of these um, preferences across the surface gives rise to a characteristic map. And the most famous and well-known example of this is the orientation preference map, i.e. the layout of the preferred orientations across the map. Um, so this is usually plotted as being color-coded, where colors run from 0 to 180 degree, because orientation, um, the periodicity of uh, orientation is 180 degree and not 360 degree. So as I already mentioned, um, we're not going to be looking at the big problem that is why do we have these maps and, why do they, and how do they develop, but at the sort of more humble question of given noisy data, how can we analyze this data and get the best map out of the data and assess the confidence with which we can estimate the map. And I'm quickly going to sketch what the, what the usual approach for estimating orientation preference map or other cortical maps from, from um, imaging measurements is. And the way uh, an orientation preference map is usually represented is as a complex field. So, okay, at any point, um, the, the map is defined by a complex number where the, the absolute value of the number tells us how strongly tuned that, that location is and the, the complex argument, it tells us how, what the preferred orientation is. Of course, we can also split that up in just the usual representation of a real and imaginary part. And the way it's estimated is that you take n different oriented gratings. I mean, they don't all have to be different, but you need a couple of different orientations. And then you measure responses to them and then you take the vector average of the responses. So for every response that you measure, um, you multiply it by e to the twice, the stimulus you presented, twice because we're interested in orientation, not direction, and then you take that vector average by back averaging these complex numbers. And what you get out is in a good case a map like that. In a bad case it looks a lot more noisy, so it's sort of, with bare eye it can be quite hard to actually see the structure. So there's this smoothing step. So people pick a Gaussian kernel or some sort of a band pass filter, and apply linear filtering to the map. And then you get this pretty map that comes out, and that's, that's the orientation preference map. And this approach has been very useful and led to many great insights. It doesn't, the, the, at least a couple of questions open. So one question is sort of the, the second smoothing step, right? It's not clear how to set the parameters, and boringly, actually, how you set the parameters determines what the map looks like. So if, if you choose your smoothing too big, then you get a different map out than otherwise. And it has qualitatively, can have qualitatively different properties. The second question is, uh, pr problem is um, that this approach is completely blind to the noise that you have. So if your noise is not constant across the map or is even correlated across the map, that might give you biases in, in your estimate. Um, this is, uh, the third point is not really a problem of the approach, but just a limitation. And that is, it doesn't give you any information about the map at locations where you didn't measure. So let's say there's a pixel where, or a, a region of space where you didn't have any measurements. The approach is completely blind to saying what the map would have been in that location. And the next point is, the map also, uh, this approach doesn't tell you how, with what confidence you can estimate the map or different properties of the map, right? You get a map out and it often looks good, but you don't actually know how well constrained the map is at different locations. And finally, um, 
Again, because we don't have a noise model, we don't really know how much information about the underlying stimuli the map has. It might be a pretty looking map, which has huge noise around it, which means that it's sort of one has to be careful on how to interpret its implication for coding. And what we're going to do in, in, in the following is to look at a Gaussian process model of the map, so a statistical model of both the map and the noise, and treat estimation of the map as just parameter inference in this model. And with that approach, um, we will try to estimate the map. And I want to point out that as a statistical problem, of course, this, this kind of problem is, is not new and has been studied, for example, or similar problems have been studied, for example, in, in geostatistics, where they're known as co krieging And it's, it's for example, one, um, one similar application is to estimate um, the distribution of wind directions across the, um, not cortical surface in this case, but um, the orbit from, from measurements, right? You have some measurements and you want to have a, a smooth wind field and that sort of statistically it's the same object as, as an orientation preference map. Okay, um, just quickly, um, the, the, the statistical model that we're going to uh, assume is that we, we, we assume a Gaussian process over maps. That's our prior. So before we see any data, we assume that slices through the map are just smooth curves with some sort of length scale and, and statistic structure that I'm going to um, talk about in a minute. And then once we observe the data, that pins down the, the map at locations where the data was very um, sort of noise free. We have had lots of data. And at locations where the data was more noisy, we also get an estimate of what the map is. But we also see that there's uncertain, some uncertainty around what this map estimate is. And at locations where there was no data at all, we also get an estimate what the most likely map is, but we can also see that there's lots of uncertainty around that estimate. And, and as I said before, estimating the map is calculating the Cauchy distribution over maps in this model. And because everything is Gaussian, calculating the Cauchy distribution is calculating the posterior mean and calculating the posterior covariance. Okay. Okay. Is each line here a different slice or each line here a different measurement? So um, each line here, sorry, is a different sample from the prior. So before we see the data, all of these would be reasonable maps to assume. Sort of. and, and each of them, I mean, the map is two-dimensional. So this is just one slice. So you can think of them, each, of, each is a possible slice through the map before you've seen the data. And then this, the samples on the right side would be, the black line would be the, the most likely map after you've seen the data. And the, and the colored lines would be, also other possible lines that are still consistent with the data because they're within the confidence intervals. Okay? And um, as I said earlier, the model we assume is, is really the same underlying model as, uh, um, the, the same model that also underlies the vector averaging approach in that we assume that the response at any pixel can be thought of as a linear superposition of two coefficients multiplied by the cosine and the sine um, of, of the angle that comes in. And you can convert that to the usual sort of cosine tuning graph. But it's also clear that it, we don't have to assume cosine tuning curves, right? We could also uh, put other basis functions in here, and then in principle, we can uh, uh, model any, any, any tuning curve. So, Jacob, I'm confused last time we did the talk. Does that data can depend on X or? Um, well, it can, but mostly it doesn't. So, um, in principle, it can depend, but in, in the case that I'm going to talk about, and that also the case that's sort of most widely studied, is where you have full field stimuli. And in that case, so when you have full field uh, orientations, then every x has the same. Um, but in principle, I could rewrite the equation to put the x in. It's not, not much of a difference. OK. Oh, well, it, it's, it's computationally much more expensive if you have different x values. What is OK, so if, in, in, if one assumes cosine and sine tuning curves, then vk1 is the cosine, vk2 is the sine, and if I have more general tuning curves, more basis function, then I've just put the basis function into dk. So for every stimulus, I can rewrite it as a vector of basis functions that give me the... This should be j of x and dk uh, So the, sorry, the sum is over... The mj Ah, uh, sorry, it's MJ, sorry, it's mj. Right. Yeah, you should have asked that. No. Um, the... And, and, and also the, the, the noise residual, so the noise around this model is also Gaussian, but the covariance is not, we're not assuming it to be independent or isotropic, so we can have flexible noise models in here. Okay, so how do we get the prior? And um, it's, it's, it's well known that um, if you take white noise, 
and you convolve it with a uh, Mexican hat, so difference of Gaussian, and then you get something that's um, sort of colored noise. So we, you can take colored noise for your real part of the map and colored noise for the imaginary part of the map, and then if you combine that to a complex number and plot the argument of that complex number, you get something that to the non-expert and almost everyone else looks like a reasonable map. If you look at the map really closely or do statistics on it, you realize that the, um, the maps that people measure tend to have statistical properties that, that deviate from Gaussian random fields, but sort of as a first guess, which our prior is, it's not too far off from what reasonable maps look like. So it's a much better prior than most priors that get used in sort of Bayesian statistics. Right. Okay, so once we have the prior, I said computing and finding the map is really computing the posterior covariance and the posterior mean. The posterior covariance, if for the moment we assume that we know what the noise is, the posterior covariance is just the harmonic sum of the prior covariance, another term which depends both on the noise covariance and the stimuli we presented. So um, we can see that if we don't present any stimuli, then the posterior covariance is just the prior. And if we, once we present more and more stimuli, then this term grows linearly, so that the second term dominates. So in the limit of having lots and lots of data, the prior, of course, becomes um, unimportant. And that's how we get the posterior covariance. And once we have the posterior covariance, we can compute the posterior mean. And to do that, we first um, um, do a vector averaging. So that step is the same as in the sort of conventional approach. And then the way but then we sort of post-multiply this vector average by a term that depends both on the posterior covariance and, and the noise we have at different locations. And that's sort of, and in the, in the usual approach, you would just have a fixed linear filter here that doesn't depend on the noise properties of, of the map you estimated. So if the noise is completely isotropic and you pick the right uh, smoothing step, then the two approaches actually uh, are identical. But this is more general, and there's no free parameter for how to set your, um, your smoothing curve. Okay, um, there is a free parameter in that how to set um, the, the, the length scale of, the, the, um, of this difference of Gaussian function, right? And the different ways to do it, the principal approach in the Bayesian model would be to uh, calculate the marginal likelihood and then optimize that. Um, that didn't work too well for us, mainly for computational reasons. So what we sort of default back on is to just um, estimate the empirical um, autocorrelation of the data and match the parameters of so match the parameters of the empirically estimated covariance with our prior. That's what the um, geostatisticians refer to as variogram matching. So that's that's what we're doing here. And, and, and in the sense we expect we assume that our map is can be thought of as a sample from our prior, so it's reasonable to um, to, to match the, the two cor uh, correlation functions. Okay. Um, there's one computation problem that is the covariance matrices that I wrote down are pretty big, right? If you have 100 by 100 pixels, then that gives you 10,000 um, 10, pixels total, so the covariance um, um, is of size 10,000 by 10,000. That's still feasible, but if, if you go too much bigger, then this, this doesn't work anymore. But um, the good thing about our prior in particular is that the, its power spectrum um, decays uh, quite rapidly. Uh, it can be calculated analytically, but we don't have to do that here. The, the important point is that if we take um, we can take a low rank approximation or even something that's almost a low rank approximation that it's a, a product of two low, low rank matrices in a ridge and, and we can still find a very good approximation to the um, complete covariance function. And, and, the, and the way we can find this low rank decomposition is by doing a Cholesky decompos uh, an incomplete Cholesky decomposition. The important thing is that we can calculate the, the Cholesky decomposition without ever explicitly having to calculate K. So we just have, an, have a function that tells us what kxy is. We can calculate the low-rank approximation. And that's important because we never ever want to store k in memory. Okay. And uh, I use a similar model for the noise covariance. So assume that I can write my noise covariance as a low-rank product and, and some uh, diagonal matrix um, psi of phi. Always confused. Anyway. And, the, and this noise model actually can be interpreted as... as as that we assume that noise arises from, from common input in this case. But I mean, it's important to notice that the noise in imaging measurement is mostly real noise. It's not necessarily biological noise. So common input could be common input from the measurement device. So the, um, the, the common input or the correlated part of the noise is captured by the lowering product, and the independent part of the noise is captured by the, this diagonal matrix. Can we estimate this? And we estimate this from doing factor analysis on the residuals. <laughs> And again, we can rewrite factor analysis in the way that we never ever have to store the complete noise covariance. 
And now there's a catch, right? I said earlier, well, when we estimate the mean, we assume we know the noise. And now we estimate the noise knowing, uh, assuming that we know um, the mean, right? Because to calculate residuals, we need to know what the, the mean is. And the, the way to get around that is, so we first start off with an independent estimate of the noise, use that to calculate the mean, and we iterate between um, optimizing the posterior mean and the, the noise covariance, sigma epsilon. Okay. And so first I'm going to show on, sort of on, on synthetic data how, how this works. So I generated a, um, a synthetic map by sampling from my prior, and that's what I refer to as the true map. And then I generated some noisy measurements where the statistics of the noise were roughly matched to the um, statistics of the noise I had in real data. And I tried to recover it with, um, with the um, Gaussian process model by looking at the posterior mean. And not only do we get a posterior mean, but we also get a posterior variance at any point in time. Color scale here is not particularly good, but you can see that the um, preferred orientation is well constrained in regions where we don't have, uh, where we're far away from pinwheels, and it's not well constrained at <coughs> these white lines, which are the zero crossings of the map. So when the complex and the real part of the map are close to zero, then uh, so the orientation is almost ill-defined. And can you compare it to the smoothing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Hein. Yeah. Anyway, so the... Um, so I said the smoothing map is a free parameter, right? So um, the question is how I should choose the free parameter. And of course, I can just choose a really bad smoothing parameter, and then I'm, I'm, I'm in business. But so what we did is to say, well, we want to give the smoothing map the best chance, right? So even if it has free, free parameter, we set the free parameter by optimizing it, by comparing it to the true map, and then we, we quantify model performance using the same measure. So in a sense, we're being giving this, uh, the smoothing approach the best shot it could have by giving it access to data, the ground truth, which in a real experiment you wouldn't have. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a better test to, to start with a map that isn't from your priors and see how well you can do on that? Right. I mean, this is sort of the first part where we start from your prior. This is almost um, sort of a sanity check, right? If it doesn't work on that, it shouldn't work at all. And you can sort of slowly relax it and go to data which is also synthetic but not from your prior. But we actually... Um, so what I decided to do is uh, concentrate on synthetic data where I know the ground truth and then do um, experiments on real data because that's the test you want to do in the end anyway. And if that comes out positive, then it's not that important, at least for me, to go to sort of synthetic data which doesn't match the assumptions you put in. But even on, so I should say that even on this model, it's possible for the smoothing map to, to win, right? Because it, we're giving it one or two extra parameters that, that it can optimize by having access to the real data. And, and, our, and we also have approximations in ours, right? We have a lowering approximation, et cetera. So even on this approach, it could, and one can actually find cases where the smoothing map works better. So of course, um, performance depends on how many stimulus presentations I use. And um, it turns out that for all stimulus presentations on, on this map, it was always the, um, the Gaussian process map with correlations that performed better. And it outperformed both the smoothing approach and the Gaussian process approach, which didn't have noise correlations. So it actually, the Gaussian process approach with no noise correlation was not that much better as the smoothing approach. And still you could say, well, maybe I was just lucky, right? I sampled many um, estimates from a prior, and for one it worked, and that's the one I'm showing. So um, to rule that out, I, I, I repeated that procedure many, many times. And you can see that even in the, also in the average across many samples, we're doing consistently better than both the smoothing approach and the Gaussian process approach which in, with independent noise. And of course, the different approaches get closer and closer together as you go to bigger data set sizes. <laughs> because they should all converge to the same map uh, in the end. But it, it's worth pointing out that even sort of towards the end, where they all get together, if, if you plot it, sort of, if you plot one minus the correlation coefficient, you see that sort of even the rate at which they converge to the true map in this regime is still, um, is still different, right? And, and you could say, well, it's only a difference like here between 0.9 and uh, 0.8, but if you, look at, sort of, if you look at that direction, you can see that for 0.9, you actually need uh, almost half as many stimulus presentations as for the, um, for the other approach. Okay. Um, so I know Matthias Kishube, um, when he was trying to uh, count pinwheel density, he found that a, uh, a, a very sharp, uh, I, I guess it was a... High, so I, he used a, in, in the Fourier domain, he used a logistic. Yeah, instead, filter. instead of a Gaussian, he got much better performance. So right. Have you tried comparing to that kind of thing? So I've, I've not used the logistic filter. I've used a sort of a, the difference of Gaussian and, and other filters. And all the filters that I compared to didn't help it. So it doesn't seem to be the filter shape that's a problem. 
but the uh, correlated noise. But I mean, his point was, was that he needed a fairly sharp cutoff um, with the idea, I think, that the, the signal was all in the lower frequencies. And so with a, a sharp cutoff, you could be really getting rid of a lot of the noise without disturbing the signal. Right, I also use filters that have sharper cutoff. But in, in, at least in the data set that I had, uh, the dominant problem seemed to be the, the correlated noise across the, across the um, map, not the exact filter shape. Um, so this is the, the real data that I applied it to. It was um, acquired in, the, in the, the lab of Len White and you. And it was um, uh, optical imaging of intrinsic signals in paired visual cortex. And they used square wave gratings, full field um, gratings, which were drifting across the cortical surface of a ferret and both the image is the mostly V1 but also portion of V2, the, the boundary is not that clear in, or not that easy to see in, in ferrets. And, and the, so the part of the data that I cut out is, um, is this sort of 100 by 250 pixel map and where, where each pixel corresponds to 30 microns. So I'm gonna talk about pixels mostly but each pixel is 30 microns. And so, and in, in, in the assumptions that I stated earlier, right, the construction of the prior really assumes that the real part and the independent map, part of the map are uncorrelated. So I checked that on the data, and it seems to be they're not quite uncorrelated, and I, of course I can't rule out any higher order correlations, but at least the, the sort of the instantaneous first order correlation seems to be pretty low. So that assumption seems to be reasonable, at least to some degree. And also I looked at whether this difference of Gaussian shape, at least the radio component, is consistent with the map, and it doesn't also seem to be quite the right model, but it doesn't seem to be too far off. Okay, um, so this is, um, this is the data in the model, and I also talked, I mentioned that the, the, the noise is very structured on the map, and the main reason for that is, of course, that... This is used for your, for your prior, the, the shape? Um, this is used for the prior, but I cross-validate. So I, I, I fit the prior, <coughs> so I fit... So the model performance is reported in data that it did not use to fit the prior. And so the noise variances across the surface are, they, 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 they range over um, a wide range even on a log scale. And you can see that as expected, the noise is really much higher where it looks like there would be blood vessels. And if you compare it to the blood vessel image, that actually are the, the, the major blood vessels that you see. So if, if the variance was really the same across the map, which implicitly the smoothing approach assumes, then all the um, estimated noise variances would be in this, um, sort of between the two gray bars, but you can see that the range of noise variances is really orders of magnitudes bigger. And not only do we have noise variances, which is structured around the map, but also the noise correlations are structured around the map. So if you just plot um, the noise correlation of every pixel with each sort of uh, 20 nearest neighbors, then you see that you get something out that looks even more like the vessel image. So if, if one zoomed in here, actually you would even see finer blood vessels. And, 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 and the, the noise correlations are pretty big. I mean, when interpreting that histogram of noise correlations, it's important to keep in mind that this is average noise correlations. So this is average across many neighbors. Okay. Um, what pre-processing was done according to this? Okay, so the pre-processing I did, I, I, the, for every measurement, I subtracted the mean divided by the um, standard deviation. And also sort of, I also ran it without doing that. But that, that was the only pre-processing I did. I mean, and it is, so that's the pre-processing I did. There might have been pre-processing steps sort of in the amplifier or in the, in the measurement device, but in terms of once it comes out of the device, there's no other pre-processing so apart from converting the method. You mean the difference between the actual data and your... No, actually, so the, the nice thing about the data set here is, which I should have mentioned, is they used uh, 800 similar presentations, which is a lot more than they usually do. So this, um, this is... Uh, so for every, each of the eight conditions, we actually have 100 different stimuli. So we can reasonably well estimate just on the raw data the mean response on the data and then the correlation around that. So that's, so the, the estimate of noise correlations is not one from my model, but from the data. So is there any reason to think you can get uh, a sensible orientation from the blood vessels? I mean, it seems like an alternative would just be use this method or some other method to identify the blood vessels and then cut them out of the rest of them. Right, I mean, to some degree, the map is doing that a bit because the noise variance is really high. So when it's doing the smoothing, it would tell them to ignore the measurements here and fill in the measurement it has nearby. That's sort of actually what, what it does, that it decides whether it should trust the pixel measurement or not. And it's, it, it's, it's, sort of, it's blind to whether it's a blood vessel or some other noise. 
Um, it's, it's hard to write in it, right? Because it's, you have much more uh, dimensions. There are methods based on TCA, which, um, which, um, which are also used to estimate maps, and they get around that problem to some degree. They have other problems, which, um, for example, they don't, um, they don't allow you to fill any regions because they don't have a model of the map, right? And they don't really have a good um, noise estimate at different locations. But it's true. If, um, if, if you want it, you have the same problem. But it, whitening is not trivial. Oh, because you have no You have much more dimensions than, than this. Can you comment about the spatial size of the noise outside of the Outside of the, uh, I don't know. So it falls off. Well, I, I don't have the plot here, unfortunately. It falls off slowly in an, in an ugly manner. So it's not, it doesn't drop off quickly. Yeah. So it's. Um, it's, it's, it's quite heavy tail the, the drop off of the noise. Yeah. Um, okay, so for, for real data, of course, we don't have ground truth, right? So what I do to, to estimate the, um, the model quality, I take 95% of my data and do the raw estimate of the map. Now, I assume that to be the true underlying map. And of course, it's not the true map, right? Because you know that, um, well, we don't know what the true map that is, or even if you find it. But that's, that's the best we can do on real data, and that's the proxy. Um, for the true map that I'm going to use. And then I, I take the other 5% of the data and estimate the raw map on that and try to reconstruct the, the true map, so to say, from, from those 5%, and I use both the Gaussian process approach, which in this case is a correlation of 0.8, uh, 0.87 with the true map, and I can use a smoothing approach, which in this case has a correlation of only 0.74. So, so the true map is simply averaging over the 95% or smoothing? Or this is just averaging, not smoothing. Just averaging. Just averaging. And that's really sort of courtesy to the data being um, them having hundreds similar uh, presentations and, and very clean data. So on other data sets that it look like, if you take all the data and estimate it, uh, it doesn't, doesn't look like that. It looks more like that. Okay, um, so that was for one example. It's also true in the average. So if I take the Gaussian process approach versus the smoothing approach, then there's sort of 0.5 difference in correlation coefficient. And on the, I mean, there are 20 possible ways of doing that. And in 18 out of those 20, the Gaussian process map. Works better. And that was for orientation preference maps. We can do a similar trick for direction preference maps. Uh, in that case, because the, um, uh, the, the new, well, at least on the sort of on a map level in ferret visual cortex, the direction um, tuning is not that strong. So I, 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 I had to use 10% um, of the data to get any reasonable estimate of the direction preference map. And even for that, you could argue that, well, um, that's not really that clean a map you get out. But if, if I make this bigger, right, then the true, my true map gets worse. So there's, there's a trade-off, and I just stop at 10%. And again, you can see that um, both for individual maps and on the average, the Gaussian process approach works, works better than, than, than just doing smoothing. Um, the, the other feature that I mentioned earlier is that we don't have to use all of the data, right? We, we can just say, well, we use only data at some locations and try to estimate um, the map from the measurements only at these pixel locations. And the, I mean, of course, sort of the idea behind is that if, if you can do that and you have a close and you've established a map between the tuning of single cells and the local population around it, then you should be able to estimate orientation preference maps just from uh, multi-electrode recordings. So the, the spacing of the gray dots here is, is 400 microns, so 13 pixels in my case, which corresponds to the spacing we use array. And so if you only take that data and use the Gaussian process approach, you can reconstruct the map. Can't reconstruct the fine details, but you get sort of a, the coarse um, features of the map, I think, are all, all preserved. And again, you could say, well, can I just use the smoothing approach, right? I just place a Gaussian blob on each of these points. And then, of course, the, the, the estimate of the absolute value that you get will be terrible because it drops off between, it sort of drops off between any two points, right? Because you put a blob here and a blob here, and it will be lower in between. But we can still get a good estimate of, um, of the um, preferred orientation that's actually not too bad. So if you just use the simple smoothing approach, you get something that looks reasonable, but you can also see that the fine details are much better than the, uh, or some of the fine details are better than the GD reconstruction. In particular, the smooth map also has this tendency to have, um, to have, to be oriented along the um, array, <laughs> array directions, right? Because um, if you pay, place a Gaussian block here and here, then the intersection is a straight line that's perpendicular to the, perpendicular to the array. And again, I, I optimized the smoothing parameter by um, maximizing the correlation with the empirical map. And I, I don't have the numbers here, but this is like 
point two or point three better. Okay. So the spacing is related to the correct uh, correlation name? Uh, the spacing oh of course. I mean this is a linear reconstruction, so you cannot do reconstruction of the maps that are much bigger than the correlation length of, right. of your data. So you chose it like as a high boost spacing? So the spacing I chose by taking looking up what the spacing of a UT array is and using that as my spacing. Right. If, um, and that, so if my spacing was bigger or if I was looking at a map that has much finer spatial structure, then I could do that, right? <laughs> because there's no way linearly to reconstruct it. You know. So if you go to that one slide and you look at the comparison of the comparison process and the um, So when you look at the correlation, is that kind of averaging over everything? Can you comment on which word does the GPU model does much better than the GPU model? So we are on the map. And I also quantified it by looking at extracting pinwheels and then looking at the distances, and that also outperforms, but didn't systematically investigate what the... It seems to be more that, in some cases, the smooth map does really badly, in others it does okay, and just once in a while it has sort of cases where it's really bad. I couldn't really find consistent patterns. I mean, of course, the patterns, the problems are cases where you have much noise. So if you have a really strong blood vessel, then what the measurement there was, was strongly dominates one but not the other. Um, okay, so we just had that. You don't have a problem with the uncertainty, the uncertainty in this case? For this case, I don't have it. I mean, like, like in places like, say, the upper left, yeah. you would be interpolate the array, or extrapolate. Right, I mean, right. This, I mean, this is actually another advantage of the GP for instruction, right? Because you can. Um, it tells you how certain it is. And if you were extrapolating down to here, you would get some estimate of what the map is. It would even be periodic, but it would also tell you that it, it's really guessing. And it doesn't know what the... Right, because if you do the top left, that's a So up here, it's, I mean, yeah, sort of at the edge, it's, it's completely, well, it's not completely guessing, but it's, it's extrapolating from the data. So just assuming that it will wiggle on with the same periodicity. And that's not the case. I mean, I'm sure we can find a case, like maybe here, right? It's guessing blue but actually continues as, as we. Okay, um, the other, um, so we have a statistical model of both our data and the noise, right? So for every stimulus and every, um, every response, we can say what's the likelihood of that response under our model. And we can use that for decoding. So given the measured response, we can try to decode what the preferred, uh, what the orientation of the stimulus was. And we can do that as a function of the number of pixels you use for decoding. And the nice thing is we don't actually have to refit a classifier or something at each point. So you can just trace out, you can estimate the map and then cut out pixels from it and sort of do the whole analysis for the whole line by only ever fitting one, one model. And it turns out, sort of a qualitatively similar picture as before, that if the, the smooth and the independent estimate are not actually that different, but the, uh, the Gaussian process map actually goes down to, um, to, to much lower error rates. So in this case it would be 0.05 and the other bar would be at point, um, one five or something. And that was decoding the orientation of the stimulus. We can also decode the direction, but of course direction and orientation depend on each other. So to sort of separate the two, I tell the classifier what the orientation is and ask what, given that orientation, are you moving up or down? So it, that's a binary task where the, the um, chance level would be 50%. In that case, we can see that the difference is actually much, much bigger. Because direct, estimating direction is, is noisier in, in, in ferrets both the um, smooth and the independence of the ones that don't have a good noise model actually never go below point, uh, like 30% error rate. And the other one goes down um, at least to less than, much less than 10%. I mean, it's important to keep in mind that we're um, decoding he um, a neural correlate, right? Not neural data. Um, I know that's popularly done. It doesn't mean that, so that's certainly not something the brain ever has to do. Okay, um, so I'm gonna, I don't have much time left. Um, I'm going to look at that quickly, and that is um, the, once we have fitted the data, we can sample from the posterior, right? So we can generate different maps that are equally consistent with our data. And this, I just pulled out an example where you can see that in some cases from our posterior, we, um, it's not quite sure whether the, the white line and the black line here intersect. So in some cases when we sample from the posterior, we get two pinwheels here, and sometimes we don't get a pinwheel. So by, providing, by, by repeating that procedure, we can get an estimate of how certain we are about the fact that there is a presence here or not. And by averaging across many of these repetitions, we can sort of generate a heat map of where we know there would be pinwheels, 
and where we don't, um, and where we think there might not be pin use. And in this case, you see that if you use AT stimuli, that there should be this sort of light blue shaded region here telling that there might be pin use or not. But when we use 400 stimuli, you can really see that if, if the model is certain that there would be two pin use there. And we can quantify that by, oops, and we can quantify that by looking at the, so the, the entropy of, of that map. But it's, I mean, it's important to keep in mind that entropy here is really a measure I use, but we shouldn't really interpret it as entropy. It's hugely, um, sort of hugely biased in this case because we're estimating the entropy of these little dots from the whole data. Okay, so. Um, Uh, but it's hard. But what's the posterior mean of a pinwheel, right? The pinwheel is a really nonlinear function of the pinwheel is a really nonlinear function of the map, right? So um, I, it's not possible to directly estimate. So and I, I sort of estimate the posterior mean of the pinwheels by sampling them with here and then calculating the pinwheels. Okay. So um, last slide is the so that that's just our model again. So the response is linear and stimulus has a common input term and has some private variability. And the model is, is boring in at least two ways. The first one is it doesn't have any temporal dynamics, right? So there's no, we have stimulus, we have response, and they just, um, they interact and that's it. Well, they don't even interact, just one cause the other. So one way to make them more interesting, and that's something that I'm currently working on, is to um, replace the static common input term by one that has um, linear, at least linear, a linear dynamical system across time. So now our common input is, um, is a linear dynamical system that we're estimating over time. And that approach is um, closely related to Gaussian process factor analysis that Manish has worked on previously. But we have sort of one extra addition that we put in here is that we have this, this prior and this sort of the spatial structure and form the map. And it's also uh, related to a Kalman filtering model because it's a linear model with linear dynamics um, where the linear dynamics are unobserved. So, so when you say that the linear dynamical system on what time scale are you talking about? One presentation or longer? Uh, no, that would be. Um, that would be not so. That would be sub presentation time scale. Across presentation. No, no. The um, within the presentation, there's also temporal dynamics, right? Uh -huh. Which we're ignoring here. I mean, it could also be across presentation, but I was mostly thinking of it as sort of during the presentation we had temporal dynamics that are going on. But they could carry on over across the next presentation. And um, and one one extra addition that we're thinking about is. Of course, now we have the, the, under the linear system as a noise model and the stimulus come top of it, but you could also feed the stimulus into the dynamical system and then have the response sitting top of it. But that's sort of an extra was And the, the other um, boring thing, I guess you would say, is that there are no spikes in the model, right? It, it's, I mean, first the data is applied to and the noise model doesn't have any spikes. Um, so what we can do and are going to do is replace the, the, this Gaussian likelihood term by a point process likelihood, um, most likely a Poisson process. And then that sort of extends the Kalman filtering to extended Kalman filtering. And at that point, uh, we also find to apply to spiking data because otherwise uh, there would be no much point in putting in a spike in that field. Um, so this is just a very, um, I, I think I said all that. So I'm just, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna skip that and just thank my collaborators again, Matthias, Sebastian, Len, and Matthias, and Manish with um, whom I was working on the extensions. Okay, thanks for your time. So I have two comments on that. First, and the first comment is that we're not only interested in the prior distribution, right? In many cases, people are actually interested in the particular map they have. For example, you want to correlate it with some other measurement you've taken, or you want to look at. So in, in many cases, people are very much interested in the map they're looking at, and not in just the general statistical properties of the map. Sorry? Is the real data better than real data? Well, the real data is... Is 100%, is that not better? 
Yes. Right, and so the argument could be you always do as many trials that you don't need any cost to But l let me just answer his point first and then we'll get to that. So the other argument is, so the prior that I put in is actually quite not very strong. The only thing that I put in is the length scale and, and so the, the, the autocorrelation function of the map. But there are very many interesting higher order features of the map, and I'm not constraining them at all. Right? In fact, well, I implicitly am, but actually by, by using Gaussian process prior, sort of I'm, I'm, I'm maximum entropy in all the higher order properties. So as soon as you're interested in anything that's higher order, which much of the interesting stuff is, then we're not being biased. Well, we're sort of being in, in biased in a minimal fashion that might be less biased than some of the other processing that's being done. So that's, and to the point that, well, so, so well, something if, if you know, if you have enough time to estimate completely your map and all the properties, you don't need any costing, right? But even the true map, right, it was a bit noisy. So if you wanted to estimate pin on that, you would get pin all over the place. So even what, in, in a big data set with very clean and, and loads of trials, you would not be able to do most of the analysis that people are interested in when they do analyze notation data. So you have to do costing. Of course, if you have a better measurement device, that to some degree is always a better solution. Thank you again. Thanks.